Welcome to the Addiction Connection podcast, connecting the hope of the gospel with the heart of addiction. I'm your host, Mark Shaw. Today's podcast is a little different. I have a testimony ready for you from a man who founded the church where I serve and am privileged to be a member of at Grace Fellowship Church here in Florence, Kentucky. He's also an elder, and his name is Steve Barnett. I asked Steve to give his testimony at our 2019 Addiction CDT, that's Counseling and Discipleship Training Conference. I asked him to give his testimony because it's just powerful, and he gave me permission to uh, use it here in our podcast. It's a little longer than most podcasts. It's about uh, almost 40 minutes in length. But I think you'll be encouraged as you hear Steve's journey and what the Lord did in his life and and how God uses him now as one of the leaders in our church. So a very powerful picture of redemptive, the redemptive power of Christ and the hope of the gospel for the heart of addiction. I wanted to read just a quick couple of verses here out of Revelation 12, starting in verse 10. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Here's Steve Barnett's testimony about the transformational power of God in the hearts of the addicted. My life, I was raised in a um, in this area. It was uh, two good parents. I was one of three kids. I had two older sisters. And um, we went to church every week, probably more than once, to the Evangelical Methodist Church. It was uh, seriously legalistic, and it, I was trying to think of how to say it's an advanced demographic. Everybody was really old. Um, <laughs> my dad was, you know, always employed. I had two parents in the home. Uh, we were good kids. We were well above average academically and with with sports. We got along well. My dad was an overachieving disciplinarian, if you understand what I mean. Um, But as I began to grow up, somehow I was just the kid that was prone to trouble. I just got in trouble. Uh, Sometimes innocent mischievousness from boredom, sometimes because I wanted to stand out. I don't know. I remember in the first grade, at the beginning of the first grade, and I didn't go to kindergarten, I remember going to the principal's office in the first grade. Um, I, was, I was good at it. Uh, some would say I still am. Um, I had, I, I just kind of conformed to a youthful and rigid view of Christianity and, and tried to be a good kid. Uh, until I got somewhere in my teens, early teens, and that just didn't make sense to me anymore. It, it just, so I kind of shed all that. And um, deep inside of me, I knew, Romans chapter 1 tells us that we know that there is a God. I knew that there was a God. I didn't deny that. I didn't feel like I needed to deny that. I just didn't understand that. I didn't know what to do with it. I had no clue, really, what he was like. I didn't have conferences like this. We didn't have this kind of teaching. Um, I didn't didn't know what to do with that, so I just kind of shoved it aside. My sinful desires, the very things that we've been hearing about this morning, my, my friendships were probably less than the right kids to hang out with, and, um, so I began to get into stuff that I shouldn't have been into, um, smoking and drinking and, and just rebellious kind of behavior, thinking there's got to be more. You know, when you, at the end of the day, going to bed, 
it's like there's just got to be more. Romans uh, 1, 18 to 21 says, I knew that there was something missing. I just didn't have any clues. And um, so I was the kind of kid, I just didn't, it didn't bother me to, to go to a store and want something, maybe even have the money and not want to pay for it and to steal it. Um, it was kind of kind of exciting. I think maybe a game, kind of thing, or or um, in a locker room, take stuff out of lockers, or even breaking and entering. I remember breaking, you know, window and going in a house. Uh, you know, some of this stuff doesn't make sense to me now, but it made sense at the time. I just wanted to do that kind of thing. Um, my lifestyle evolved into where this was the late sixties. Okay. So I started smoking weed, and I started smoke a lot of weed, probably all day, and um, taking amphetamines, and that kind of uh, evolved into, I'm doing a long period of time, that evolved into amphetamines, LSD was, was big at the time, went into barbiturates, um, snorting cocaine, and then various opioids, Percocet, Demerol, Morphine. I turned so many friends, friends on at school. Um, I was selling drugs because I needed the money. And then the farther I went, I was selling people, selling drugs to people that would sell the drugs. And um, all this while I was a sophomore, junior, and senior in high school. I was that guy. And, uh, you know, parents would say, don't hang around with that kid. But then in a four-month period, God rocked my world on um, on May the 4th in 1973, I turned 18. In June, I graduated from high school somehow. Um and then in August, I got arrested for armed robbery and um, convicted of armed robbery, sentenced to 16 years of hard labor in Kentucky State Penitentiary. I, I do remember standing in front of that judge and hearing that gavel hit. It's funny, the, the times that stand out to you. And then just the next month, September, I went to LaGrange. Um, 16 years of hard labor, barely 18. Prison is ugly. I suppose it should be, but it, it certainly is. I, uh, I clearly remember September 5th, 1973. As a young 145, let me, let me put this up there now. That's pitiful, isn't it? As a young 145-pound 18-year-old, Looking up at uh, that tower, my hands were shackled, my feet were shackled, and they were shackled together. Couldn't hardly walk. Walking up to those huge, heavy doors that they couldn't hardly even open, and seeing the gun towers and the barbed wire fence on top of the fences, um, it was sickening. It still is. Nothing about that made was nonsense. And there was nothing that allowed me to believe that I would survive the day. So inner orientation, boy, that's a trip. Um, but I found myself, I, I, was, I was expecting I would have to kill somebody or be killed pretty quickly. And I did have to fight. I had to fight fist fight or whatever was around uh, a lot, and it was a dark time. It was a dark place for a long time. But praise God, and I want to jump out here because God was working in those circumstances. And if I would have shared this twenty years ago, I, I, 
I, I wouldn't have the same perspective. I can see God, how he did things at the time that I couldn't recognize. Um, and it, it makes so much sense now. Um, my, if you jump out of my life and think, what's going on with my parents? Oh, they were devastated. Um, my sisters, they, they actually loved me. You know, they, um, there was new levels of desperation in their lives. And they were desperately crying out to God. And they had their friends crying out to God. My sister was a missionary. She had people around the world crying out to God. They were humbled. It was, it's, it's humiliating. So that's what was going on in their life. And they're praying for this knucklehead who's, you know, got thrown in prison. But I, on the other hand, I wasn't interested in a jailhouse kind of religion. Um, just, you know, it didn't seem to make sense. And I applied myself to becoming a student of the ways to survive, um, where I was generally alone, uh, the, the youngest, smallest generally. They would call us, uh, they called us a fish, you know, when you're a new one, newbie in the prison. And so, uh, you know, just trying to sort out this whole process. And so that was for months, and uh, that was a long time. Uh, God miraculously intervened again. And again, I didn't see this at the time, but um, I, I do now. Uh, I was transferred to a minimum security facility. And in the process, you know, my charge was armed robbery. I had 16 years. If you go to this minimum security, you can't have more than five years. And there was, I don't know how all that happened. But when I got there, they didn't want me and they tried to send me back and they wouldn't take me when I go back. So I end up... Um, at this place, what you might say, starting off on the wrong foot. The warden did not want me there, and I was kind of shoved down his throat. So it's like, cool, that's a nice way to start off another place. And, um, but it, it was a minimum security, but, but there were still killers there. There were robbers, um, all these bad guys, not like me. <laughs> Druggies. All kinds of stuff. It, it's a trip. It's, um, but my reputation preceded me that I was willing to fight at the drop of a hat. So, and it was a minimum security. So I didn't really have to do that quite as much. It wasn't nearly as difficult as life in LaGrange. So I was grateful to be there. Um, I became institutionalized. I just, I just uh, focused on uh, what was the game at hand, survival, trying to get the things that I wanted. Um, and over time, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I, I ended up, and this is, again, months and months, maybe a year. I don't know how long it took. I was the president of the resident council, an inmates union. <laughs> That's just comical to me. There really was. <laughs> um, and it was comical to everybody else, too, the guards. You know, we thought we had something going on. So I was a mouthpiece. I was causing trouble. And, um, and this was not a ministry, folks. This was prison. And, and they get you under their thumb, and they just, you know, you're like, you're like a rat or a mouse to a cat, and they just have fun with it. But I noticed one guard wasn't quite like that, and I was convinced that guy probably smoked dope when he went home. And I kind of liked him, and he was younger. He wasn't old. And it's like I began to develop a relationship, and sure enough, I was right. He did. And um, <laughs> so we were able to introduce a supply chain of drugs inside of the prison. <laughs> Made sense at the time. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit. At the beginning, when I went to this minimum security institution, uh, there was a guy I went with, John, his, um, he was my partner. We were walking towards two men and I didn't know who they were. That was Haskins, Mr. Haskins, Mr. Piles. They were the counselors, guidance counselors, and everybody had to have a guidance counselor. So I was assigned to Haskins and he was assigned to Piles. I didn't know that either. But as we were walking, they, one looked at the other one and said, let's swap guys. Okay. So my counselor ended up being Mr. Piles, and John's ended up being Haskins. 
Um, so there's four things that I kind of want to, uh, and these are no-brainers, but, but the first one is if you have a choice on who you're counseling or if you have a say, don't just pick what you want. Um, think, pray, be sensitive to God's spirit. When Lauren Piles looked at Haskins, I didn't know it, but Lauren Piles was a charismatic Southern Baptist pastor who had the Holy Spirit. And he just sensed that he wanted to swap. He had no idea why, but he was sensitive to that. And so it changed my life. I'm not going to go into it, but my partner, John, he ended up going a different track. He's dead. He got killed in prison. And I'm not sure that it had to do with that decision And if somebody is going to give you names, trust that God will be in that selection process. The second thing is to listen. Listen carefully. My story didn't start when I got to them and I was sitting down for the first time with Mr. Piles, right? God had been doing all kinds of things in my life. And... He would ask me questions because we had to meet once a week one-on-one and then we had a group counseling, um, which was very instructive when I look back on it. But Lauren would ask me questions. You talk about asking questions. He asked me questions and I was not being sincere or transparent at all. You know, you don't, you just don't let any, that kind of stuff go on. And he would just kind of squint his eyes and shake his head and look at me. I didn't like that. And he didn't talk a lot. He listened and he would ask me. And um, he would respond clearly, but he wasn't solving it. He was collecting data. He, he was trying to discern, which is what this is. Look carefully and try to discern What's been going on in that person's life that you're talking to? Most of the story may be done, or just maybe it's God was working in my life, and he was, he was putting that stuff together. I didn't like him. <laughs> didn't like him at all. <clears throat> Somewhere, this is about a year or so into this facility I was in for quite a while. Got introduced. There was a new inmate that came, probably transferred from LaGrange, and I noticed... He had a guitar that was attractive to me. I hadn't seen anybody playing guitars. And uh, he talked to me, and he shoved a guitar in my chest. It's like, oh. And, and the thought came that maybe, maybe I could play guitar. Maybe I could learn some of that. So I began to spend some time with him. And, you know, usually I'd be over here with gambling with these guys. These new fish came in. We would take all their money before they figured out that, you know, we were just going to cheat it out of them one way or the other. <laughs> Quit hanging out with these guys. Start hanging out with this guy. Well, Donnie, his, he had dabbled quite a bit um, in the occult, probably more than dabbled. But, but his mind, he had a spiritual mindset and a perspective. And, it kinda, and he lived with a witch, whatever that is, on, on the street is what he said. And I didn't kind of like that. And about the same time, that's when The Exorcist came out. Remember The Exorcist? And I watched that. That freaked me out. I didn't like any of that stuff. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what part was real and what part was, you know, Hollywood. It, but it unnerved me, I think. I felt um, helpless, vulnerable. And so I, I went and talked to Mr. Piles. And it's like, I got to do this tactfully because I don't want him thinking... Um, but it's like, what do you think of all of this evil spirit? And if you look around in prison, it, it's just, it's just obvious. I think the enemy is not nearly as subtle as he is in a place like this in his tactics. And it's just, um, it's just obvious. And I asked him what he, what he thought about that. He just looked at me and squint his eyes and asked some questions. It's like, can't you just answer a question? <laughs> and, and this is the third thing. St- 
steer them towards God's word. Use God's word. Lauren said to me, as we were ending a session, he said, Barnett, do you, uh, do you have a Bible? I said, do I have a Bible? And I remember thinking that uh, my sister had shoved a Bible in my face when I went to court, you know, years before. And I didn't think I'd thrown it away. I said, I, I think I do in the bottom of my footlocker. He said, dig it out. He said, read the red. Read the red. And praise the Lord for Lauren Piles. I began to read the Bible, and it, it was like that. It was, un, un, it was just unusual. It was very applicable to what I was seeing, the things when I was reading the red, when I was looking around me. And it began, I, praise God, he, had, he was taking my stone heart, and he was beginning to soften it. And I had a counselor who saw all that stuff going on, and he recognized what was going on. And I'm grateful that he was sensitive to the Spirit because he's not going to fix me at all. There's nothing he could have said or done to me. And, um, but he didn't try. He just watched and prayed. The fourth thing is to pray, pray, pray like crazy. Pray like your life depends on it because it does. And I remember meeting Lauren's wife. I don't remember the circumstance, Sally. She's a sweet lady. But um, Sally was a little frail lady. And and somebody said, well, this is Steve Barnett. She said, oh, I know. I know Steve Barnett. And she looked at me (laughs) and she said, I pray for you every day, Steve. I didn't like that either. (laughs) Have you ever wanted to pray? Usually, in, this is in the hard times when you get kicked somehow or cut off at the knees and just not had the words. There came a time uh, one evening when somebody said, um, Steve, they're having a church thing up in the cafeteria. It's like, okay, sweet, go for it. And he said, well, you want to go? It's like, nope. He said, there's some some girls up there, (laughs) some cake and cookies. It's like, well, maybe. (laughs) It's been a while. What I found there was a redneck, greasy-haired, fire and brimstone preacher who who knew Jesus, and he preached the gospel. And I had already been under conviction, not knowing what that was. And I became gripped and could not resist. And there's, there's some interesting stories that I would like to share about what was going on there in the spiritual world. And it, it was really a bizarre time. But what I do remember is going forward, and I knelt at a faded orange plastic prison cafeteria chair and just had no words. And so I groaned. I give up. That's all I had. There was no counselor. There was no help. There was no coaching. It's like, God, if you're real and and I believe, I am yours. No games. I believe that he was offering me complete forgiveness for my sin. Not the things I had done, but for my sin, singular. And that there was forgiveness offered, that he had been my sacrifice. So I think I walked into new life at that point. Who knows, really? January the 6th, 1976. I wish I knew who that preacher was. I look forward to greeting him one day. Well, I woke up the next day completely flabbergasted, and I remember there's some things I don't remember a lot. Um, Maybe that's God's mercy. But I remember waking up that next day 
thinking, what have I done? (laughs) I had no idea what to do. Here I am, the president of the resident council, getting special privileges over here. Who knows what that guard was thinking that was selling me dope? He was freaking out, no doubt. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do. I, do. I did figure I should rip down these pictures in my, in my foot locker. And I, and I knew that whatever I had to do, had to do something with the Bible. So I got my Bible out and I began to read it and read it. I would read six or seven or eight hours a day. I got my hands on a chain reference Bible and I, I would sleep on it, put it under my pillow. I would eat it. Last night, I heard that we should aggressively pursue Jesus. I began to aggressively pursue Jesus. I wanted to know everything, but it made so much sense. God was bringing life to me. And I considered as I was preparing for this, whether I should... Um, share this or not, because it just may not make sense, but I, I just have to, because at the time, it was such a significant point. I walked out of the dormitory one day, and I remember, saw the grass, and the grass was green, like a vibrant green, and I looked, and the sky was blue, and people were people. I mean, I went out and hugged a tree. I wanted to eat dirt. It's that God had opened my eyes. I was blind, and now I see. It it was just stunning to me what he can do inside of a heart. And that's what we want to affect in the lives of people, is what God can do. Some trust in chariots or counseling, and some trust in horses or the Y diagram. <laughs> but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Amen. So there were difficult circumstances for sure uh, mistreatment, persecution. About this time, I remember a book. How many remember Chuck Colson? Um, there was a book, Born Again. He was in Nixon's cabinet, got convicted, went to prison. I was reading that book, Born Again. And the circumstances that he was in was very similar to the dormitory because we didn't have cell blocks and stuff in this place. And it was a dormitory kind of situation. It was like just real interesting to me, very applicable. And I remember, though, one time those guys knelt down in the dormitory at their bed and prayed for the people around them their salvation. And I cringed when I read that. It's like, that would be terrible. But what I found when I got saved was that there were a couple other Christians in the population, incognito Christians. And I, I discovered those guys, and there was a couple other guys that got saved. So while hating the scorn, I just felt convicted that we need to pray for these guys. So we got on our knees in my bed and we prayed. Of course, there's a group around us that are jeering, maybe even spitting. But we were praying for their salvation. And don't you know that God began to save people? And I, um, I just expected it because that's what we were asking him to do. So much so that the culture was quickly changing. And the warden called me in the office and said, this is not a church camp. Do you know what I can do to your life? He was hearing far too many praise the Lords out there on the prison yard. (laughs) That's exactly what it was. I don't know if he was under conviction or some sort of ulterior motive. And by the way, he lives in this area now. He's retired and I stay in touch with that guy. That's an interesting relationship. (laughs) But all the while, I was reading God's word. And I remember in Hebrews chapter 10 about needing to persevere, being publicly exposed to insult and persecution, and to be encouraged and live by faith so that when we had persevered and done the will of God, we will receive what he has promised for us. It was like, that was my daily life. It was so 
much encouragement. Mr. Piles helped when, when I talked to him. So back at the ranch, when I think of you and who I'm talking to again, counseling with some soul isn't sometimes that we begin our notion of what the problem is going to be. You know, we bring to it, it's like these guys are an alcoholic, I know, or this is divorce. Brad, you were saying some of those things. Um, we kind of go in with the solutions, not really knowing the story. I just want to encourage you, don't look back at what has happened. Look forward at what God can do. Amen. God can do what he wants to do. And he will do what he wants to do. And I'm so grateful for what he did in my life. I'm hopeful that there is somebody in this room who is Mr. Piles for somebody. Well, there are many other acts that I saw God do, healings, miraculous answers to prayer. But mostly, if I'm going to share my testimony, I have to say, thank you, God, for opening your word to my heart. And he gave me a peace that was, uh, I could not articulate it. And that's what had been missing in my life as a teenager. That's what I had not known is peace. So praise God for his word. While I was incarcerated, I continued to study scripture until I got out. There was also a couple college classes that I was able to take in psychology and sociology and stuff. I remember taking one class, abnormal psychology, and I could read all about myself. And then on November 9th in 1977, I went up in front of a parole board and they granted me parole and I, could, I uh, left. I had been transferred to another institution. I wasn't at Frenchburg. I was at Blackburn. Which, and so I ended up going to University of Kentucky, which, by the way, they won the NCAA championship that year. <laughs> so to bring us up to date um, where I am, and I know lunch is coming here, so I, um, the following year... I sensed that God wanted me to go to Asbury College, and I wasn't all that jazzed about that, but I, he was clear to me, so I did that. And that's where God clearly provided my beautiful and faithful wife, Jane. Raise your hand, Jane. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> what was she thinking? <laughs> and then I graduated in 1981, um, and I have to say, at one point when I was at Asbury, got together a group of guys and people, was going to Blackburn, to the prison, to preach, to share my testimony. And yes, I took female classmates. And yes, I asked them to make cakes and cookies and cupcakes. <laughs> and I took my guitar, and we went back. And, uh, and one time I was sharing my testimony in the gospel and uh, there was a guy across that I, the circle, and I, I met him afterwards. I said, Joe, I, I didn't know that you were in prison. What happened? And he said, don't, don't look at me. Don't act like you know me. He put on this old prison thing. He's like, Joe, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, I don't act like you know me. I said, Joe, I know you. I know your brother. I know your wife. I've been in your home. He said, who are you? I said, Steve Barnett. He said, you're not Steve Barnett. I know Steve Barnett. <laughs> so praise the Lord how he can change a life. Just, just think of what God can do. I was, in fact, a new creature. So I taught, went and taught school, coached for about five years at a Catholic school of all things. Sister principal kept a tight leash on me. <laughs> Worked at GE for about 12 years. Um, Jane and I were blessed to be a part of, of this plan and praise God for a place that teaches God's word. Amen. Yeah. 
1996, I started a business in the honeycomb in the aviation supply chain. God has been gracious in that endeavor. Um, I was told in the process that I have hepatitis from sharing needles with all of the idiots that I was hanging around with back in the day. We all had hepatitis C and that uh, they didn't tell me I was terminal. They said, Steve, if you want to take a vacation with your family, you need to schedule it. And it's like, well, that's kind of a nice way to say that. Um, So I did a year of chemo. Some of you here remember that. And um, I don't think that worked. Limped along for a little bit, did another year. Um, God has blessed us with um, seven kids. Four of them are married. um, And they found rapidly growing. Amy, where's Amy? Dr. Deshar, God love her. Um, put me against that wall over there and wagged her finger at me until I went to see her. And she, she just had a sense that I had rapidly grown cancer in my liver and um, maybe didn't even have time to get on a transplant list. Somehow she did that. And uh, that was at the end of 13. And then in just 30 or 60 days, I had gotten a liver transplant. So I'm, I'm grateful for Amy and for God's spirit and how he wor- works and currently I'm alive and healthy <laughs> and as grateful as I know how to be. Special thanks to Steve Barnett for sharing his testimony with us today. I know it encouraged my heart and, I, and I'm sure it will yours as well. Join us next time on the Addiction Connection podcast.